We continue our candidate interviews in the 14th District with 14th District State Representative Gina Mossbrooker on the phone with us this morning. Good morning, Gina. Good morning. How are you? Very well. Very well. We're Good. all healthy. I'm so happy to hear your voice. Yeah, we're all we're all <laughs> healthy and and uh, and we, we've been following all the coronavirus guidelines and everything like that. So uh, excellent. Yeah. Well, I thank you for the opportunity to speak with you. Definitely, Gina. Tell us uh, tell us a little bit about yourself while you're running. Well, I am all about faith, family, and friends. It's third term incumbent from the Washington Legislature. I love life. I'm a blessed mom, nana, daughter. I own and operate small businesses. I have my family has for over 50 years, and we have a century farm even in our family, which is over 100 years old. Wow. I'm grateful to be one of two women in leadership, a minority deputy caucus chair. I'm ranking in members. I just um, I believe in taking action, working hard, and bringing people together to find solutions so I can help those I serve. I love life. <laughs> Gina, you, um, uh, coronavirus, uh, boy, that seems to be the thing that's uh, the most pressing issue uh, in our state today, right? It's Jesus just encompassing everyone's everyone's lives. How have we done? How's How do you think the uh, state has responded to the coronavirus, i.e. the governor? I think he did what he had to do in the beginning, and I think we were grateful for that just because we were literally leading through the fog during the pandemic. We had no roadmap. There was no previous, you know, path forward that we could rely on, and he did what he needed to do. I do think that we could do a better job of balancing health and safety at this point um, and opening things safely as much as possible. We've seen it, you know, we've seen grocery stores and other businesses be effective in that manner and keeping people safe. But I'm just super proud of Yakima. I mean, every time I'm on the phone with colleagues or even the governor, we get this, you know, Yakima is the model county. Yakima has done an amazing job. You know, you should follow Yakima because they've dropped their numbers. They followed the rules and they're making a difference in showing that the things in place are working. So it's really, it's an honor to represent a county that's making it happen. There was um, a lot of pushback in Yakima initially. Um, mm-hmm. I, don't, I don't know what it was like down on the southern end of the district. Uh, was it as, uh, uh, as intense a feeling down there as as it was up here, or can you gauge that? I think there were remote pockets of people who were very concerned, of course, as we all are about constitutional rights and not wearing a mask, but it was really, it came down to life or death, and this is a deadly virus. And I think that we needed to make sure that we take care of people around us. If you didn't want to keep yourself safe, there were times we were thinking, that's your decision, but not when you have the opportunity, um, sadly, to infect the person next to you. We had a lot of you know, older people going to the store to finally break out of their house and get bread, milk, and eggs. And they were extremely stern if somebody next to them didn't have a mask on to keep them safe. So I think it was more about just taking care of other people and making sure we think of them as well. And then I think that's why Yakima kicked in and other areas kicked in too. So um, I, I guess that I'll say one more question about COVID, then I, I, we can move on. But, you know, we, I, I agree that we didn't know what we were dealing with uh, from the beginning. Uh, but to set up the dashboard, mm. set up the criteria that really didn't uh, seem to uh, uh, reflect the realities of uh, jobs and careers and the movement necessary uh, on this side of the state with agriculture and then to sort of lock everybody into the zone they're in and, and sort of make up new adjustments within uh, within the the, code, the, the the phase number that you're in. I, I don't know. It, it just There's an awful lot of folks that I talk to that, that just really feel that uh, uh, the governor's winging it and, and winging it um, by way of not relinquishing uh, authority that he seems to enjoy from an emergency situation. Uh, do you feel the need to cap the length of time that a that a governor can maintain emergency authorities and, and that sort of thing that we're seeing in some other states? Uh, I do. I think that we've already got movement towards that. If we can get into session, which would be great. Um, what the state of emergency is set up for usually a short-term emergency, like an OSO landslide or just something that 
you can't pull the legislature back in because it's just too fast and you have to act to save lives. He can pull the legislature back in, and we are willing to go back to work. We're willing to sit in our chairs safely and distance from each other using the galleries and other areas of the Capitol in order to help make decisions. There's three equal branches of government, and we haven't seen this during the pandemic. Well, we haven't, um, so it'll be interesting to see what the legislation looks like. But will you see each other? There's talk of a uh, uh, you know, distanced legislature. What do you think of that? Uh, yesterday. Actually, yesterday we had a remote legislative session, mock session, a practice session, huh. where we were all online, and we went through many security measures. It went through our, our laptop from the legislature, and it had 98 spots filled virtually. Uh, They pulled up mock bills, and we were able to speak on the bills. We could vote yes or no. A voting box would come up, the red and green. We would vote, and then you could raise your hand literally, um, and you could speak on a bill. So this is already happening. We've already had one practice session. We're scheduled for more. Many of us, especially local legislators, we volunteer to try to see so if it does happen we're ahead of the game and we know how it's going to work that way we can get rid of the broadband issues and see if it's even possible but that's already happening so you're comfortable that if it needs to go that way it's going to go well i I just want to make sure if we go that way that it works because i have issues with rural broadband and many of our legislators especially way eastern spokane okanagan area they they literally will have to drive in order to find internet to go to legislate and then possibly go back home. There's just a lot of unknowns. So this is an opportunity to figure it out if that's the way that the majority of the people and the majority party decides is probably what will happen. Then we want to, I want to make sure I was educated and can serve people the best I could. But this is already happening. You know, I, I'm wondering, the, the, the district seems so big, and I, I'm wondering if you're seeing diversity in the district. I mean, are people like up in Yakima, you're hearing... You know, we want to take off our masks. Uh, you're hearing that we want to keep them on in a different part of the district or vice versa. I mean, what are you hearing? I think people in the beginning wore a mask. They were completely fine with it. We have to do everything we can. We were really in the unknown. I think that we have disaster fatigue, right? We have this yeah. situation where we're, we've been in our houses. We've, we've seen grocery stores at the same time do this safely and do it correctly. Some businesses can't open, some can't. That's extremely frustrating for us because you can go to Walmart, but you can't go to the local retail store, small retail store, and safely and manage the COVID. So I, I think that's the confusion. I, I think people went through that phase, and then they got frustrated. And they said, we're going to take the mask off. We saw pockets of that and protests, literally, on that. On the, There's been months of protesting at the Capitol currently. And then now I think we're seeing possible second wave and so we're seeing people realize that the masks are worth wearing if it saves someone's life even though we don't like them boy a lot of resistance up here in yakima at least among our our uh, our listeners i should say but we certainly don't recognize you know uh, we certainly don't r- represent the entire Yakima Valley, but it just seems like there's a lot of frustration. All right, state budget, uh, a lot of frustration with the state budget. Uh, you know, it's, uh, we, we're getting a better uh, a, a better picture now, I guess, of our of uh, maybe not such a big shortfall. Um, what do you think is is uh, what's needed in in 2021? New taxes, or or maybe looking at some areas where we can cut the budget. No, we do not need new taxes. I think families are hurting across the state. Businesses are definitely hurting. Um, the businesses that I help run, you know, I have a couple still closed. And the hotel itself was closed for two months. So we were able to find ways to safely reopen. One of my other businesses is completely closed, has been closed the whole time. Some are opening just modified stages. So I don't think that new taxes are even possible for some of these businesses. We saw this just, I think it's an imbalance between health and safety. We, we realize we have to be safe, but we can't destroy the economy along the way. And that seems to be what's happening. I, as far as the budget goes, we thought we were $9 billion in the hole. It turns out with the revenue forecast we had recently that we're $4.2 billion. And there's another revenue forecast coming in November, which will be very telling. 
and we're seeing revenue still stream back in for the businesses that are open. We saw federal stimulus money. We saw the cannabis industry actually was higher than anticipated as well. And so there's three choices when we have a hole in the budget. We either raise taxes, we cut programs, or we, the federal government rides in on a white horse and pays it for us, which I don't foresee happening. Yeah. We, um, the, uh, as far as the budget cuts, or the, we really wanted to go back to special session in order to be in that conversation and do strategic cuts versus across-the-board cuts, which were being proposed, 15% every agency. That There's some that are we can be more efficient with in our dollars, and there's some that are extremely important that should not be cut because they're already putting the communities at risk. You know, yesterday, I don't know if you caught the governor, but he said we could get the $30 car tabs if he could increase taxes somewhere else. Did you hear that? I did. Yeah. There's so many taxes proposed right now. We've got a social tax. We've got income tax, capital gains tax. There's, there was an unemployment solvency fund tax, which they took off, but I think it's going to end up somewhere else. There's just so many taxes. I don't see how possibly during a state of emergency, a pandemic, families hurting, that we or businesses, families or businesses can can add taxes right now. I think that there's a way to do it. Otherwise, with strategic cuts and also that revenue forecast in November may make it so that we don't. We have enough money to get to the end of the year. We had quite a bit in reserves, not as much as we'd wished, have no idea what was going to happen when we pulled out a session as far as COVID and the, the length of the state of emergency. But we've got, a, I think we've got options, and November will, will really tell the story about what we need to do as far as the budget. And we take a quick break uh, for weather, and we will come back to our candidate interviews right here on News Talk KIT. Thank you, Gina. Hold on. We want to talk to you for the next half an hour. AM 1280 News Talk KIT, 844, Wednesday. Politics continues. We are... Less than two weeks away from the election, and we're checking in with candidates all this week. Uh, today, uh, it's the 14th district, and Gina Mossbrucker, who has been here many times over her several, uh, what, is this your third or fourth go-around, Gina? Um, I had three previous terms. You always have the best music. <laughs> Just want to let you know that. <laughs> well, thank you. Uh, um, we do a lot of interviews, but your music is definitely the best. <laughs> I suppose that's a one part of the job that m- maybe many of us don't even stop to think about. But you know, you you got to get what you're doing out to everybody else, and so that would constitute an awful lot of interviews. So uh, we appreciate your time this morning. Um, well, we appreciate that opportunity. How uh, tricky has campaigning been in this uh, COVID time? I mean, a lot of times you can have rallies or gatherings with uh, interest groups or whatever. Uh, how's this uh, complicated things for you? It's definitely changed. It's been more difficult to reach out. Uh, Mostly at this point, we've been spending more time just helping people. We've got hundreds of calls a week regarding unemployment claims that hadn't been paid from the Employment Security Department. So we're doing a lot of basically full-time legislating since we left. We've got legislation. We're getting ready to pre-file for December. We're just constantly... I reach out to the district, across the district, from one end to the other, on phone calls weekly and ask, what can my office do for you? So it's it's really helpful to meet with um, agencies and say, do you need more PPE? What is it that we can do? That community connection is really key, and I've been doing it for months since we got back. So I'm really grateful for those people that jump on those calls, even though they're really busy, and just share an update with me and then how my office can help their office. We certainly have had a few folks mm-hmm. here want to get a hold of you guys for help with the uh – Getting the unemployment and that sort of thing. Um, what? Uh, how? How in touch with uh, the national scene are you guys as far as the, the the debate over the stimulus and what that might mean for Washington State? I know that um, you know there was some money for governments in the past and all of this. Is that anything that you folks are even even contemplate as you uh, think about the next legislative session that there might be some more Washington help headed this way? Uh, we do consider it. I don't think we count on it. We're, we're hopeful that it's coming. The last negotiations in Congress were re- it was resulting about $300 million back to cities and counties for local government. So we're definitely in favor of that, helping communities stay strong. We pay attention to it. We write letters to colleagues uh, congressionally and encourage 
help if, you know, if it's out there. We want to make sure we constantly, and especially on these community connection calls I do uh, regularly, we're connecting USDA to farmers or ranchers who need help. We're connecting. We're making those. We're connecting the dots, basically, and the needs throughout the community. If they need more PPE, we're connecting different grants and loans that are coming in for those, especially with businesses. The the economic development people throughout our district are amazing. They're instantly getting those CARES Act dollars, bringing them in, processing them, getting outreach out to let people know that they're available. And then the turnaround times are just incredible. And that's from Klickitat County, Skamania County, Yakima County, Clark. They're all just we have really exceptional people in place trying to be lifelines for those small businesses. And so it's been it's been we connect the dots. We don't have power to make that change. But any dollars that are coming, we try to bring them home as quick as possible and make those connections to the need. Well, that that makes sense. Uh, I it's it's just frustrating as we look at those businesses that could use a help and and all of that, and we see the the squabble, the partisan squabble, um, with the election and all, kind of getting in the way of any sort of common sense decisions being made. Um, what do you see uh, as we uh, move down the road? Um, in in the wake of the McCleary decision and all the time and energy spent on education, we just talked to your opponent. He is a teacher. Uh, he thinks more needs to be done for education. Uh, where would you see yourself uh, at on the big picture, especially in the weirdness of COVID and who's not in school and the number of people that have, you know, across the district who've dropped out of the public school system to look for other things? That's a great question. It's concerning teachers have been amazing in the way that they have had to be flexible and adapt to meet the needs of their students during the pandemic to switch from a in-person program over to online must have been extremely challenging but they stepped up to the plate and they did what they could do the budget currently has over i think 52 percent currently for education i feel like that was a very large increase this last session i feel like that's um, very important I do think that we've got to support the teachers and do what they can. I, I had the privilege of teaching uh, art and physical education at a Christian school for years, and I understand the needs of making those connections. And it's so important to pay attention to what's happening to teaching as far as it's not just curriculum. You know, they are having to step in and fill the family role in many cases. They're going to have to deal with you know, harm to a child or, or domestic violence, mental health counseling, just a different ways that students learn. And it's just always amazing to me how they step in and become, you know, they make, they give them food, you know, with the food. It's a, it's a resource. They're just, they've had to not just be a teacher. They've had to put many hats on in order to, to take care. And it takes a village, of course, to raise a child and they've really stepped up. So I do see that being part of the conversation. I'm really happy McClary's over um, I hope there's not a McClary 2.0 in inequality on education. It's difficult with areas that don't have Internet. Uh, you know, are they getting the same education as a, as a student who does? Probably not. So we're doing everything we can to try to get that broadband out there if that's the way people are learning. We lost 110 students in my own school district here in the small town. I think you're over 1,000 there who just decided to stay home. That does translate to dollars and a different way of learning that we have to support. Uh, sex education. Let's talk uh, sex education. We've got a bill out there. We've got referendum 90 on the ballot. Uh, first of all, I take it, uh, well, I'm going to ask you, your opponent supports this current sex education bill. Where do you stand on that, and how do you feel about a referendum 90? Uh, thank you for the question. I do not support referendum I do not support the sex ed proposal that was passed. Uh, in fact, one of my my last floor speeches at 2 a.m. before we left session was against this bill. This bill, if you read it, if you read the curriculum that's proposed, you would probably also oppose it. We, we don't, we're not against sexual education. We think that's important. But the way that this is written, it's very graphic. And honestly, I had colleagues that were didn't even want to talk about the bill because it it had things in it that we thought were completely age appropriate for us, much less a kindergartner. Wow. Uh, it has to be local school district control. It has to be parental choice. The curriculum in this particular issue on 90 is um, extreme as far as a curriculum that 
I would not want my granddaughters or daughters or but you sons can opt to. Out. You know. you yeah, can, we hear that all the time. You can opt out. You can opt <laughs> representative. Out. Yeah. You can yeah, have your kids you like go sit in the li- child? Yeah, go yeah. sit in the library yeah. where everybody yeah, yeah. 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 And then worry about bullying and social pressure and yeah, I don't think that opt out is, is really um health and who, who the children are just gonna leave the classroom and share it with the person who got opted out, right? Yeah. So we're trying to we're trying inclusion and we're trying to bring people together and get the same education. We fight for that. It's part of what McClary was about. But now you can decide your particular child isn't we've seen people can threaten to leave school systems if this is taught and it, it's really up to the parents we have to keep control and have less government control i mean it's it, it, we need sex education right in school Absolutely. or not yeah we need sex Absolutely. education in school Absolutely. i mean yeah I, I don't think you're, you're you're disagreeing there right not at all. I do think that. I, I 100% agree with that. The way that this is written, and I would encourage everyone to pull that Senate bill up and read it, and you will be absolutely um, appalled. I can't imagine anyone that would allow or hand that to their child, even if they were homeschooling. I wow. found I found a copy wow. of the bill under my daughter's mattress. <laughs> hidden. That's where I, That's about I think. Right. I hope not. My, I hope not. Where my generation, I think, hid material. <laughs> now that I think about it, hey, I got to tease you a little bit, uh, Madam Representative. Uh, I'm looking at my voters pamphlet, and uh, I look to see your smiling face. And uh, my <laughs> gosh, my dear, you are uh, you are a w o l. What happened with that? A little pale. Yeah, it was a technical difficulty, I was told. Mike Culp, um, Chief Culp, had the same issue. If you look at his, it says no information submitted. The information was submitted. So there were a few of us that it just didn't work, and we're not sure exactly why. Um, You can find information on my website. You can call me. Uh, Most everyone out there has my cell phone, my personal cell phone in many cases. Um, And, again, it's 509 250 zero six seven nine we are very responsive uh we've we've not had anyone saying we haven't been and i i'm happy to fix things my my job is to listen to people in my district i love that part about my job it's what makes it my dream job you know we we've ta- i've listened to the tribes to help with missing and murdered indigenous women i've listened to michelle about her missing son in yakima cody who's still missing I've listened to Teresa and Wapato, and we created Travis Alert, two different bills on that. I've listened when people said their rape tests weren't, weren't tested, and we've got national work now that I'm doing on that. Veterans, I've listened to veterans say I couldn't get a job, and that first bill that I passed in 2015 has over 5,000 veterans hired because of that bill. So I am very responsive. I love to hear what you want me to work on because I work for you. Pretty, uh, pretty cut and dried right there. Uh, and we wish that more of our legislators um, across the Hill and uh, everywhere had that same opinion. The idea of public service is truly being a servant to the public and their needs, interests, and wishes need to come first. So we have much respect mm-hmm. for that, uh, that perspective. So good on you. Um, anything that you want okay, to uh, point out as the, the, the next big either thing that you're going to be working on because, you know, you find a way to sort of transcend the, the partisan divide over there. You guys are, are in the uh-huh. minority significantly, only down 16 uh, seats or something like that. I don't, <laughs> I don't know how the, this election will change that. But you always find stuff that uh, to work on that finds uh, acceptance on both sides because you're not so caught up in uh, political gamesmanship as just working on things that affect the lives of people. So what's up the sleeve? What's in the purse of Gina Mosbrucker? Right. Well, I appreciate that. I, you know, I think that politics and negative campaigning and is just gets in the way of great policy. And so every bill I've ever done since I got there has a Democrat on line, too. Uh, the, the, the secret that people don't know is that 90 percent of what we work on there is not even partisan. You know, it's just not. We've got safety and we've got we all want education for our children. We all want you know, businesses that are successful. So we just need to work together. And I went there to fix things. Honestly, I didn't go there to push one party or the other. I went there to just fix things. So as far as the future, I really think it's going to be about rebuilding after the aftermath of this. You know, we've been in this extended state of emergency, and 
I feel called to do this work by my faith. And so I didn't know I was going to look for missing and murdered girls. I didn't, you know, I just, I pray about what the next thing is. And I, I follow that and try to change the world in my own way. I don't have a, an agenda I, as far as I think we're all having to be extremely flexible every single day through this pandemic and state of emergency and what's going to happen and trying to keep people as safe as possible. Like you said, I have sick colleagues. I have family members that I've been sick. I, I, I believe in COVID, and I think that there's a way to keep people safe, keep the economy going, and still um, make sure that we, we get control of this and we take care of people we serve. So I don't have a big agenda. I'm trying to stay flexible, but I think a lot of it's going to be about repairing and healing. I'm going to really work hard to encourage business, future businesses to come forward and promote startups, trying to repair the economy so that we have that base to take care of people we serve in our communities. Gina, about a minute and a half left. Uh, we always give everyone a chance. I think we've done with this with you for a number of times. Uh, everyone's in the elevator and they're all staring at you, and you get a chance to tell them all why that they should be voting for you. Thank you. I think because I'm proven. I've spent the last six years working hard to, to listen to people. I'm very responsive. I, I don't ask for money, which has been an issue in the campaign. I'm not about sending letters out asking for money. I know people are hurting and trying to take care of their own families with an uncertain future, so I'm not constantly asking for money, which is why you're seeing some corporations step in. I don't ask them for money either. They think I'm doing a great job. My vote does not reflect which corporations donate or not. You can look that up. It's all public record. I'm accessible and boots on the ground, whether it's listening to the homeless in Yakima a couple of weeks ago, just going out and talking to them and giving them socks and trying to understand what I can do to help them or unemployment calls. I, I just, it's an honor to serve. I want to continue to serve and be the voice for those people who are forgotten or left out. I want to change the world, not just do a state bill and make it national and I'm just humbly asking for your vote and grateful for the opportunity to serve. And thank you so much for keeping us informed and being fun while you do it. <laughs> that's it's our really that's hard. our motto. We're running on the fun campaign. We're out of time. Gina Mossbrucker, thank best you. of good luck. Thank you for your service. Thank you. And we'll be talking to you down the road, 1280 KIT.